In just a few moments, we'll be doing some reading from Jeremiah 37, excuse me, 38. If you'd like to go ahead and turn there, in about five minutes, Jeremiah 38, and we're beginning at verse 17. I want to start by asking the question, if you've ever been afraid, insecure, a little uncertain about the future of life, have, have problems kind of rocked your boat a little bit, and let me give you some reminders to help you understand the past times that you have had those things. You know, we've had our various health issues that come and go. They seem to come more and more as we get a little bit older. Uh, there's always employment concerns, economy concerns, there's the war, there's terrorism, there gas prices who never figure those things out if you figure that out you're doing real good then there's the housing market that seems to be on a downtrend then there's your falling 401k then there's pollution that's going to kill us all eventually right and then you got food contamination you don't know if you're going to get e coli or not the next time you eat a burger wherever you eat your burgers out at then you got your retirement concerns and social security and what are the politicians going to do with our future and then bless your heart some of you are still raising a family won't even try to discuss those fears. Then your insurance premiums don't go but one way, and that's always up. Then there's educational expense if you do still have kids, and of course we've got moral decay. We've got all kinds of things, and that's just a short list, isn't it? We've got all kinds of things that are always vying for our attention and giving us some problems. And then we have verses like 2 Timothy 1 and 7, where he says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love, and of sound mind. Now you got this whole entire list of stuff that we have to deal with, and then you read, but we don't have a spirit of fear. Or Philippians 4:19, where it tells us, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Jesus Christ. And so you read a verse like that, and you say, Well, what is going on here? Because I know I'm feeling overwhelmed sometimes, but God says we shouldn't feel overwhelmed. Paul would say, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. And I think sometimes we find ourselves kind of in a dilemma. Can I really trust God? Can I really put it all in His hands? Or should I kind of hold back a little bit? And there's a, a little wavering sometime. The idea of a little wavering is not new at all. That's been around since Zedekiah, about 587 B.C. And that's where we're going to do a little reading here. Here in one hand, we're going to find Zedekiah. I'm going to say Zedekiah sooner or later. Zedekiah gets some instruction from God. And obviously he doesn't like that instruction because as in our second reading, which would be in chapter 39, we'll see that he ignores what God says to do. And we ourselves get ourselves in that dilemma sometimes trying to figure out what to do with life. Starting Jeremiah 38, verse 17. Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, Thus says the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, If you surely surrender to the king of Babylon's princes, then your soul shall live. Now pause here a second, because what he's saying is, now when this army comes against you, give up. Surrender. That's not a wise nor a common battle strategy, is it? But that's exactly what God tells him to do. He says, you surrender, Everything's going to be all right. Your soul shall live. This city shall not be burned with fire. And you and your house shall live. Now there's his promise. But if you do not surrender to the king of Babylon's princes, then this city shall be given into the hand of the Chaldeans. They shall burn it with fire. And you shall not escape from their hand. And Zedekiah the king said to Jeremiah, I'm afraid of the Jews who have defected to the Chaldeans, lest they deliver me into their hands and they abuse me. But Jeremiah said, They shall not deliver you. Please obey the voice of the Lord, which I speak to you. So it shall be well with you, and your soul shall live. But if you refuse to surrender... This is the word that the Lord has shown me. And he goes on in verse 22 on down at least through verse 23 to tell him about the destruction that's going to come upon him. Now, he has the direction that's been given to him. He says, this is what you got to do if you want everything to go okay. Now, it's not according to human wisdom. It's certainly not according to political wisdom, but it's exactly what God says to do. Surrender. Don't fight him. Now, you look at chapter 39. Let's start at verse 1. In the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, 
In the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and besieged it. Now that was in the ninth year. Now there's this long siege going on. Verse 2 says, In the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, in the ninth day of the month, the city was penetrated. Now they have been under siege for a long time. And all the princes of the king of Babylon came in and sat at the middle gate, and it lists all the names there. We'll go to verse 4 now. So it was when Zedekiah, the king of Judah, and all the men of war saw them that they fled and went out of the city by night by way of the king's garden, by the gate between the two walls, and went out by the way of the plain. Now that looks like the thing to do, doesn't it? I mean, your enemy has besieged you. They've been out there a couple of years. They finally break through, and things are really looking tight. What in, what in anybody's mind would say, okay, it's time to surrender and plead for their mercy? No, there's a gate, there's a path open. We're taking it, we're heading for the hills. That's exactly what Zedekiah does. Verse 5, But the Chaldean army pursued them, overtook Zedekiah in the plain of Jericho, and when they had captured him, they brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, in Riblah, in the land of Hamath, where he pronounced judgment on him. Then the king of Babylon killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes in Riblah. The king of Babylon also killed all the noblemen of Judah. Moreover, he put out Zedekiah's eyes, bound him with bronze fetters to carry him off to Babylon. Now, think about that. The last thing that Zedekiah saw was his sons being killed and perhaps some of the noblemen also being killed. Why? Because he did not do what God said to do. God gave him instruction. He doubted God's instruction, feared God's instruction, wasn't sure what to do with it. So in fear, he ran a different direction than what God told him to do. Verse 8, And the Chaldeans burned the king's house and the houses of the people with fire and broke down the walls of Jerusalem. And it goes on to tell of some of the destruction that came upon them. This is the dilemma we find ourselves in. God says, I've given you the spirit. I've given you courage, I've given you power, I've given you a way to everlasting life. It is a straight and narrow way, but this is the way you got to go. And we look at that way and go, oh, I don't know about that way. It's not like Zedekiah. Zedekiah says, here's a way. You do this, it's all going to be well, you're going to do all right. You ignore me, it's going to be bad. And man can't get it through his head to surrender and do what God said to do. And all of a sudden, he's in trouble well, in Zedekiah, up to his eyeballs and deeper, it was really, really pretty bad. And that's the same thing I'm going to suggest to you that, that we do. We have a song. We sing Trust and Obey. Let's look at the lyrics for a moment. 644. Very good song. And the lyrics we will all agree with most readily. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, with all who will trust and obey. That's the key to a successful spiritual life. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the sky, but a smile quickly drives him away. Not a doubt or a fear, a sigh or a tear can abide while we trust and obey. Now it gets challenging, doesn't it? because we had the whole list of things that we worry about, but then there's this total, complete trust and obedience in God. And when we achieve that absolute trust and obedience of God, it is, as the song says, not a shadow can rise. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief or a loss, not a frown nor a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. But it doesn't look right, does it? Going that way of suffering, sometimes you just think, no, no, that can't be right. Certainly something's wrong in the message there. No, there's no mistake. It's that we need to surrender. But we never can prove the delights of His love till on all, until all on the altar we lay for the favor He shows and the joy He bestows are for those who will trust and obey. So Zedekiah didn't understand that. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. But we do fear, don't we? 
And those fears do creep in. And we think about Matthew 7 and 14, where it says straight and narrow is the way, or because narrow is the gate, difficult is the way that leads to the light, and there are few who find it. We know it's going to be tough. We know it's going to be rough. I mean, he just flat out tells you, this is such a tough, narrow, difficult way that very few people are going to find it. Zedekiah, though, under the old covenant, he was one of those people that couldn't see what God had planned. He relied too much on his own wisdom. He was like Proverbs 14 and 12, where it says there's a way that seems right to man. Zedekiah said, I'll tell you the right thing to do. The right thing to do is to resist that old king of Babylon, try to outweigh him, and if he breaks in, we'll sneak out the back and everything will be okay in the long run. God said, no, that's not my plan. My plan is for you to surrender. And you're going to go off into captivity, but you're going to live, and your houses are going to be okay, and the city's going to be okay. Trust me. I know it doesn't look right to you, but trust me, I've got a long-term plan. But Zedekiah couldn't do it. And a lot of people can't do it either. They think, no, 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 I, I can handle it. I, I can do this on my own one way or the other. And so we go back to Jeremiah 10, 23. that says, it's not a man who walks to direct his own steps. We get in a situation where one path looks best to us, but the Bible passes, no, that's not it. The Bible says you go this way. My wisdom says, no, you go that way. The thing you have to learn to do is say, well, you know, it's not in me who walks to direct my own steps. I'm going to trust God on this. And I know the path that he's pointing out to me right now looks like pure suicide. And I'm sure that's what it looked like to Zedekiah. Surrender? Are you kidding? If the Chaldeans don't abuse me, then those Jews who've already defected, they'll abuse me. There's no way I can win doing it that way. I got a better plan. He didn't have a better plan. And sometimes we're in that same thing. We think, boy, God's way is tough. Surely God's way couldn't be the right. No, something wrong about that way that God said because we don't see what he sees. And it's kind of difficult to look on down that path. That obedience, that trust and obey is absolutely essential. Matthew 7, 21. It's those who do the will of the Father that enter the kingdom. And that's not just about denominational things that we talk about all the time. That's also these personal things that we talk about. When he says, present your body a living sacrifice. When he talks about let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. All of those things that are just basic morals that he says, this is the way to go. This verse applies to everything that God said. And sometimes it doesn't look right to us from our meager little bit of wisdom. But yet we do what God said to do. This obedience is vital. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. Talking about the return of Christ, he says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now there's how vital that obedience is. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. When He sends you down a path, and we're going to look at some specifics in a moment, that to your meager human wisdom looks like suicide, looks like foolishness, looks like it is in some way self-destructive, you've got to look past the present and look on down to eternity because those who don't obey suffer everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. You want to talk about a, a temporary self-sacrifice on this side of the tombstone or eternal destruction on the other side of the tombstone? It's not a comparison, in my opinion. Revelation, I should say 22, 14. Excuse the typo. Blessed are those who do His commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life. You see, Zedekiah missed it. He ended up seeing his family destroyed, Jerusalem destroyed, Ended up, his eyes poked out, and incidentally, that was with a red-hot poker. Not a lot of fun there, I'm certain. He ended up with the most horrible results you can imagine because he didn't do what God said to do. Had he done what God said to do, if you'll allow the parallel, he would have had to write to the tree of life. He would have had a well soul. Everything would have been fine. Now, let's talk about some specifics because there are specific areas where we look at what God said to do, just like Zedekiah did, and we go, oh, I don't know about that. That doesn't make real good sense to me. What I think is, and we start running off down our own path like Zedekiah did, and we get in more trouble than, as we say, you can shake a stick at. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. 
Seek first the kingdom of, his God, kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things will be added to you. Use this verse all the time. And so here you are, you're looking at your material concerns. That's what the context is. It's food and clothing. And God says, don't worry about it. Don't worry about that. He said, you put me number one, make me your priority. Seek first my kingdom, and I'll take care of your food and your clothing needs. And a lot of people look at that verse and go, I don't know. I just, this don't make sense to me. Boss has offered me this overtime on Sunday. I don't have to take it, but that's an extra $200 on my paycheck, and, and that's, a, that's a done deal right there. I don't know if God can really handle it if I say, no, I'd rather go to worship service, and we're 200 bucks shorter than we would be, you see? And all of a sudden, the boss says, oh, this guy works Sunday, and he'll work Sunday, and he'll work Sunday, and we get further and further away from God, and before you know it, church becomes a thing Oh, that's on the peripheral at best, if not entirely forgotten. There's a way the world looks at doing it, and the world thinks it's got it all figured out, but the world's not looking far enough. And when we forget, and we put those material things first, even if it's just first in the privacy of our heart, then we run into all kinds of trouble. When God said, me first, and you look at that and go, oh, I don't know. Remember Jeremiah 10, 23. It's not a man who walks to direct his own steps and you turn your attention back to God and said, if God said it, that settles it. I don't know how he's going to work it out, but he said he would, and I'm going to absolutely trust him with everything I've got. That's a tough one. Zedekiah couldn't do it. Can you do it? It's something to think about. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, brethren, I, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now let's pause there for a moment. He says, I just want to take your entire life and I want you to give it to me for the cause of Christ. That overlaps real good with Matthew 6.33. Or I believe it's Galatians 2.20 where Paul said, it is no longer I who lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. He'd been crucified with Christ, the idea there anyway. And so he says, just give me your life. Live it all for me. Wait a minute. Religious people usually don't do too good in our society. Usually religious people end up, you know, kind of in the shadows and ribbed and, and harassed a little bit. Um, I don't know if I really want to do that. Well, you know, from a worldly point of view, Christianity is not the best thing you can do. But God said, do it. Present your body a living sacrifice. He said, if he said it, don't question it, just do it. Sacrifice. Give yourself up to him. Can you do it? Zedekiah couldn't do it. But can you do it? That's the one that counts now, isn't it? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We are the ecclesia. We have been called out, right? So don't be conformed to this world. Get out of this world. You don't talk like this world. You don't dress like this world. You don't act like this world. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. Our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue, aren't they? That's what we sing anyway. And yet when it comes to actually doing it, it's like, oh, I don't know. You know, if I gotta, I'm going to go along at work, I'm going to get overlooked for that promotion. If I don't go along at work, then when they start laying people off, I might be the first one to go. And these concerns start coming up. And you got to look on down the line. you got to look past the tombstones where you got to look. But now you got to say, I'm going to trust God. Doesn't always make sense to me. I can't always see the wisdom in it. But God said it. That's what I'm going to do. Now again, Zedekiah couldn't do it. Can you do it? It's a tough call. And it's easy to sit in our pews and stand here at the podium and intellectually say, oh, sure. It's when push comes to shove and you're actually put in the situation. That's when it gets tough. Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We also have the song, The World's Bible, which is number 512. We, we may look at it. I'm not sure. I think you're familiar enough with it. But he says, let your light shine. Be a Christian. Be a Christian every day, every place, no matter where you are, what you're doing. You are a Christian. And that is the way you're supposed to live your life. You're not a chameleon. You don't blend in. You stand out. That's not always the wisest thing to do, though, is it? And so Zedekiah looked at his particular instruction and said, don't think that's wise. I can't do that. God said, you be the world's Bible. You be the one that stands out in your own little corner of the world because there are people you can touch that nobody else can touch. 
Now, we might know the same people, but because of personalities and stuff, some of us match up better than others. There's some people you get along great with. And somebody else gets around him, and as one friend described, another friend of mine said he's kind of like trying to hug a cactus, you know? It's just some people are that way. They're, like, they're hard to get close to, but for unexplicable reasons, somebody else gets right in and close with no problem at all. So no matter where you are, who you're around, when you're around them, you remember to let your light shine. And if for some reason that doesn't seem like the wise thing to do, then you defer back to Jeremiah 10, 23. You think about Zedekiah. When he leaned upon his own wisdom, he suffered pain and destruction like we can't begin to imagine. You don't want that to happen. Matthew 12, 36, words, let no, excuse me, I'm going back to Ephesians 4, 29. But I say unto you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. There are some people that think they got to talk like the world to get along with the world. This can happen at the workplace in your social circle, and that if I don't act like the world and talk like the world, then I'm going to be marked. I'm going to be kind of shoved out or something. And you know, you got to go along to get along. Again, mm -mm. you don't talk like the world because every word. Now you look at that passage and you go, every idle word? That seems pretty strict. That seems pretty severe. Zedekiah thought surrender was pretty severe too, but that was the way of victory. And here, learning to keep our mouth shut when it ought to be shut and not say inappropriate things is also our way of victory. I know there's some times it did sure feel good just to go ahead and say it. You know, let somebody have a piece of your mind. Of course, if your mind's like mine, you don't have too many pieces left to give away. So you need to hang on to them. Just trust God. Jeremiah 10, 23, he knows what's going on. He's got the whole big picture understood. Hebrews 13, 17, obey those who rule over you. Be submissive, for they watch out for your souls. The said believe talks about the eldership. Most authorities would agree this talks about the eldership because they watch out for your souls. It's easy to say, isn't it? We got elders, we appointed elders, we're going to get behind the elders and do what the elders say. What? Beige carpet? Who is the idiot deciding we needed beige carpet? Well, I'm going to a different church if they're going to put that kind of carpet down. Uh, you see, out of our mouth we'll say one thing like, yeah, this is the thing. This is what God wants. And then the moment that loyalty gets tested, well, well, I'm out of here. Well, there's two or three other places I could go to church and boom, and you're gone. And when you do that, you violate the entire submission the passage is talking about, and you run into the same defeat and destruction that Zedekiah did, even though you think you're doing yourself this wonderful, great, awesome blessing because you're getting out from under an idiot eldership that doesn't have any better sense than to buy a light carpet to put in a place that's going to have public traffic, you know? And I use that very trivial, silly example because people are that trivial. It's hard to find men that will step up to serve in the eldership because people can be that bad. Now, on our credit, I do not know of any case that trivial happening here at West 28. But there have been elders that have had to put up with some really bizarre stuff at times. And so you be careful. And when you're thinking you know a better way, mm -mm, God said, this is the way. You submit to them. Now, if they're in blatant violation of Scripture and they start rolling the piano or something, you know, hire a woman preacher, now it's time to stand up and make some changes and we'll defer to Acts 5 and 29 as our defense there. But otherwise, be careful. Don't do like Zedekiah. Psalms 101 verse 3, I'll set nothing wicked before my eye. Let's talk about worldly entertainment for a moment. I know we hit on it this morning, but I don't think we can hit on it too much. Now, we look at worldly entertainment, we say, boy, it looks like some fun. That looks like some excitement. It is some fun and excitement. I don't have any question in my mind that worldly entertainment will give you a temporary thrill, a temporary enjoyment. But we need to be looking further than temporary. We need to be looking way on down the road. And so when I look at the world, you go, yeah, but I'm not going to have as much fun if I do this Christian stuff. Well, from a worldly point of view, that is absolutely true. But there is also the peace that passes understanding and that close relationship with your Creator and that eternity that is yet to come, that eternal, pardon the phrase, but that eternal fun. Sure, you can opt for this little temporary worldly stuff if you want, which usually comes with a pretty mean price tag attached to it even before you get to the tombstone. 
or you can say, no, you know, let, let the Zedekiahs run down that path. I'm going to choose the way of God, and I'm going to stay the course no matter what. It's a tough call to make, though. A lot of people have trouble making those calls. Ephesians 5, 22 and 25. That, boy, it's a good thing time's running out because I get in trouble here. Wives submit to your own husbands, and the woman goes, that idiot? Are you kidding? No, that's what God said to do. Husbands, love your own wives as Christ loved the church. Gave it. But do you know who I'm married to? At its point, God said, you did it. You took the vow. You got in a relationship. This is his instruction. You do it. Even if it looks like suicide, you do what you're supposed to do. You don't pull a fast one like Zedekiah and run out another path because you really get yourself into destruction there. Now think on this just one second. Women, let, let's grant it for a moment just for illustration purposes that you are married to an idiot. Does resisting him make him any smarter? The more you resist him, I'm going to speculate the denser he gets. You might be surprised how much a little submission will enlighten a guy's eyes sometimes and how much smarter he gets when he really feels like he has your honor and respect. Men, let's pretend for a moment, just for illustration purposes again, that your wife really is wicked and she is the meanest woman on the earth. Does resisting her and hating her make her sweeter and kinder and better? You see, the way God's got a lot of wisdom in it, even if you really have a bad mate. The way of God's got a lot of wisdom in it. Because the only way you're ever going to make that situation better is by doing what God said to do. But we get into that Zedekiah zone and we can't see it. No, no, no. The only thing I need to do is I just need to get a divorce and I need to get out of here. And I need to run headlong into total eternal destruction. That would be better than staying with her or him. It's, it's kind of foolishness, isn't it? But that's what happens. Ephesians 6, 7, doing good will, doing services to the Lord, not to men. He's talking about your job here, or slaves in part here in this text. And you do that job, and you go, my idiot boss, have you met my boss? That's not the point. I know there are idiot bosses out there, but the point is we're Christian, and we do what we do for the Lord, not for men. And so you've got to get over that hump, and you've got to have the trust and the, the competence to obey God in that thing. And finally, James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4, suffering. This has been one of the biggest problems for people to figure out because we're doing it from a humanistic, physical point of view. And from that humanistic, material, physical point of view, there's only one answer to suffering. Stop it, end it, make it go away. And we don't have any other concern when we're thinking on that animalistic level. But God has a whole other thing involved with suffering. He said... Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. What? Now see, this is kind of where Zedekiah was. Let him capture me? Let him take me to Babylon? Are you kidding me? Everything's going to be good over there? And God is saying here in suffering, count it all joy. I've got a blessing in your suffering for you. But you see, it's hard to see if you don't trust completely in God. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing the testing of your faith produces patience, some say perseverance, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be complete, lacking nothing. Do you want to become a mature Christian? Do you want to become a seasoned, tough Christian? Do you want to become a Christian who lacks nothing? And guess what? You're going to have to go through some various trials because nobody reaches maturity by sitting in a pew doing nothing but singing a song about how they love Jesus and observing a few of the things that we do. You become a tough Christian, a seasoned Christian, an experienced Christian by going through various trials and keeping your eye on the go and not letting your tension drift out the ways and running for the hills like Zedekiah did. One more verse, Job 13 and 15. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That is something Zedekiah didn't understand. Zedekiah, I don't think, could have understood that. Even though I slay me. This is the trust and the obedience we're talking about. Even if God decides, okay, this is the time to die. You heading for the hills? Are you saying, you're my heavenly father, you're my maker, you're my sovereign Lord. If you will it, I'm going to work with you every way I can. I am walking with you, even through the valley of the shadow of death. When you have that total, absolute surrender like Job did there, 
Now you've got something that Zedekiah never understood, never had a chance to understand him because he was so overwhelmed by his fear that he couldn't see the wisdom of God's word and couldn't muster up the trust to rely on God's word. Brings us to a simple question. Do you have the wisdom to rely on God's word? Have you mustered up the trust to rely on it? If you are, stay the course. That's exactly what you ought to be doing.